In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. A good triodian to everyone. A good triodian. If you were here last night, you heard a little commentary on the fact that we're transitioning into the Sundays of preparation, the days of preparation for Great Lent. And today is the first Sunday of the Lenten Triodion, which is the hymn book of the season of Great Lent. The sacred texts of the hymn book of repentance were opened, ushering us into the prelude into the season of Great Lent. And it's wonderful to me that in the wisdom of the church, our beautiful, sacred, and healing tradition, we experience the wisdom to be found in healing as a process. Healing is a process. Salvation is a process. And healing for us has a lot to do with the removal of the passions, persecution of our own egos, the shedding of light on the depths of ourselves, which we're not often ready to do, even after years of experience. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is that if someone says something to you and it stings or if it offends you, it's probably your ego talking. What we should stay, say instead of saying, I can't believe you said that, we should say, thank you. Oftentimes, this is not a reason for us to accept abuses of any kind. This is important to realize. But before we react out of pride and then seek to reciprocate the damage done, we should think, is that my ego crying out? It's being persecuted by my brother or sister or neighbor who is really my benefactor, not my persecutor. They're revealing to me my own weakness, my lack of dependence on God. I was preparing for this morning and I remembered this beautiful story from the sayings of the Desert Fathers. Many of you are probably familiar with it, but it bears hearing again and again. It goes like this. It was said of Abba Sisui's that when he was at the point of death, while the fathers were sitting beside him, his face shone like the sun. He said to them, Look, Abba Anthony is coming. Saint Anthony the Great. A little later he said, Look, the choir of the prophets is coming. Again his countenance shone with brightness. And he said, Look, the choir of apostles is coming. His countenance increased in brightness. And lo, he spoke with someone. And the old men, his brethren, the other monastics around him, asked him, With whom are you speaking, Father? He said, Look, the angels are coming to fetch me. I'm begging them to do a little penance, to let me do a little penance. The old man said to him, You have no need to do penance, Father. But the old man said to them, Truly, I do not think I've even made a beginning yet. Now they all knew, they all knew that he was perfect. Once more his countenance suddenly became like the sun, and they were all filled with fear. And he said to them, Look, the Lord is coming, and he's saying, Bring me the vessel from the desert. Then there was a flash of lightning, and all the house was filled with a sweet scent. So this this monk who had lived like an angel on the earth, a life of prayer, a life of self-deprivation, really one whom those around him thought was transparent to the very energy of God. Rather than at the time of death trying to flee the world and enter into the life of come, Life, excuse me, enter into the life to come. He sought of the Lord just a little more time, just a little more time to purify his heart. Purity of heart is achieved by those who seek purity of heart. And true repentance is accomplished by way of humility. I was having a conversation with someone recently. 
And a simple little phrase come to my mind, you're not humble yet. And I thought, well, that's, I can apply that to myself, striving for humility. Don't say I'm not humble. Say, I'm not humble yet. Because, you know, to say I'm not humble could be a cop-out or a form of false humility. I'm not humble yet. I'm in process. I'm working on it. This kind of humility is thematic in the mature and the experienced Christian life. The life of the person who would be honest with himself about himself. Here's a quote from, from St. Macarius the Great. He says, This is the mark of Christianity. However much a man toils, and however many righteousnesses he performs to feel that he has done nothing, and in fasting, say, this is not fasting. And in praying, this is not prayer. And in perseverance at prayer, I've shown no perseverance. I'm only just beginning to practice and to take pains. And even if he's righteous before God, he should say, I'm not righteous, not I. I do not take pains, but I only make a beginning every day. And when we're talking about humility and repentance, we have to remember the words of our patron, St. Paul. We call him the great and holy apostle to the Gentile preacher of the nations. And he said that he was the chief among sinners. How could it be? Because he knew who he truly was in light of who God is. And we repeat his humble words as we prepare ourselves to receive Holy Communion every time. And our task is to come to realize what this means so that our words aren't just fleeting and poetical, but they're experiential and that they're true. Today during Orthros, we heard for the first time this beautiful hymn. I'm going to read it to you in full. Open to me the doors of repentance, O life giver. For my soul goeth early to the temple of thy holiness, coming to the temple of my body, wholly polluted, because, but because thou art compassionate, purify me by thy compassion and thy mercies. Prepare, prepare for me the way of salvation, O Theotokos, for I have profaned myself with coarse sins, and consumed my whole life with procrastination. But by thine intercessions purify thou me from all abomination. If I think upon the multitude of my evil deeds, wretch that I am, I tremble for the terrible day of judgment, but trusting in the compassion of thy mercy, I shout to thee, to thee like David, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy great mercy. The fear of judgment doesn't actually cause us to want to escape what is to come, but to call upon God and ask for his great mercy. He is our salvation and our strength. He's our true humility. He's our everything. So today we begin to peek through the doors of repentance, which are cracked open before us. The church preps us for the season of repentance with the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. And what is a parable but a mirror for humanity? Something to look at and see ourselves in. The Lord presents for us many teachings in the form of parables so that we might begin to see ourselves. We've spoken about this in the past and we'll speak about it again and again. How easy is it for us to feign knowledge of the other person while being completely blind to the reality of our own condition, we project oftentimes. We're all diagnosticians, so good at seeing the problems and diagnosing the issues of other people. Reminds me of the time when I was a training specialist at my last job before I became a full-time priest. And it was, I was teaching people technical processes all the time. 
We were in a regulated healthcare environment and they had to do everything the right way. And if they did it wrong, at first for me, it was like, I caught that. You know, I, I see, I'm a little, be I'm better. See, I know, I'm the subject matter expert. I can identify what they did wrong. And there was a little sense of gratification that came. But greater was the gratification that came from the discovery that identifying the flaws that they were doing gave me the opportunity to lift them up, to help them succeed, to help them to do well. It's a false joy to see the flaws in other people and to celebrate it. It's a true joy to begin to see the needs of others and identify with them and to become more compassionate, to suffer with them and to strive to lift them up a little bit. In today's parable, we encounter two characters, two caricatures of humanity whom the Lord wants us to understand. The first is the Pharisee. The Lord puts it this way. He stood and prayed thus with himself. So first, we cannot pretend to know how one might be praying. The Lord alone knows the disposition of the heart of man. I bet that Pharisee looked really pious. The people around him probably thought, I should be more like him. But only God knows the disposition of the heart. And he grants us the ability to come to know the disposition of our own hearts. If we allow him to lead us that way. So this one was praying with himself. And his prayer began with gratitude. And so he started in a good way. He started correctly. He said, I thank God. I thank thee. But what is evil but a corruption of that which is intended for good? It's a twisting of the truth. He continues corrupting gratitude by way of turning it into judgment. And he says, I thank thee that I'm not like other men. It's commendable that this man lived an upright life. We see him as someone who did the right things. He lived a life of moral purity. He even fasted and tithed. These are all things that we still do. That's the minimum standard. We're still called to take these things seriously. But alas, this poor hypocrite utilized the means as an end. And those activities that have been prescribed for the sake of sanctifying man were made superficial. They can even be corrupted when employed, not as a means of holiness, but for the sake of comparison. So when praying thus, the one who is forming the words is certainly not praying to God. Because God is the one who resists the proud and gives grace to the lowly. Surely this one believed that God was the source of the rules which he seriously followed. But he missed the point. We don't have to prove that we are God's children by proudly demonstrating our accomplishments. He knows what we have and he knows what we do not have. He knows what we've done and what we have not done. We don't need to tell him, especially not by way of comparing ourselves to others. The next one is the notorious publican. That's the one that's easy to judge. The publican, the personification of moral corruption at the expense of other people. If we were to leave the caricature of this alone, he would have been one of the most condemnable. Everyone knew what a publican was. Yet this one catches us by surprise, like Zacchaeus did a couple of weeks ago. He enters into the place of the worshipers of God, this rascal, but he's only bold by way of humility and repentance. This one whom we assume would spend his days unapologetically extorting others, extorts his own ego. We might have thought, oh, he's going in to take advantage of the people in the temple. 
to extort them, but he's extorting his own ego. We know this in this alone about man, about this man, that he was a publican, seemingly furthest from God among men. But we know that his words shot to the ears of the Almighty like an arrow. According to St. Gregory Palamas, humility is the chariot by which we ascend to God. Humility. And therefore, we're taught the means and manner by which we're to make this ascent in this parable. What a great paradox our faith is. We go high by, by going low. Our leadership model is not the, the ladder or the pyramid. It's an inverted pyramid. The best, the greatest, is the least and is the servant of all. The lowest and the one who knows his total dependency upon God. And I think, you know, we can probably see the image of ourselves in both sides of this parable. Probably within a five minute span sometimes. I'm the publican and I'm the Pharisee. I'm not that bad. Not as bad as others. I could be worse. I go to church. Sometimes I pray. I follow the rules. It's easy to identify with the Pharisee here because we can all easily identify ourselves as being better than other people in some ways and in justifying ourselves. Just a little self-analysis by way of comparison with other people. And there's no need for true humility, just pseudo-humility. I'm not, I'm not perfect, but I'm not that bad either. You know what I mean? That we do, do that all the time. The antidote to the conditions of pride and pseudo-humility is offered by the author of the parable, the Lord himself. We bow down. We muster whatever bit of honesty remains collected within our conflicted persons. And we offer these words. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The same radical humility that causes us to stand before God and ask for his mercy is also that which causes us to desire no more than to seek him and consider all things as a loss, but to know him. And in this way, then the disciples, excuse me, in this way, the disciplines of the church are not seen as obligations or impositions, but in reality, a source of true freedom. And we're, in, we're about to get into a season of serious discipline. One little paradigm shift that you, just, you should think about. It's like, yeah, Father, hard sell. I always tell people asceticism is a hard sell. Self-deprivation is a hard sell. But do I, do I have to fast? Do I have to pray? Do I have to blah, blah, blah? Do I have to? Do I have to? You don't have to do anything. You don't have to. But you can. You should. You get to. You get to trust in the healing tradition of the Holy Orthodox Church and believe that it works. And then when you go to the church is going to a trusted physician, to a hospital, the best hospital there is, and you're given the prescription, fast a little bit, pray a little more, come here a little more then you see it not as an obligation, but as a, a freedom, as a privilege, as a beautiful opportunity to draw near, to avail yourself to the love of God. We see that we're granted to be generous for the sake of honoring him, who's the source of all good, to give to those in need in order to free us from being bound to possessions. We're granted the freedom to pray because nothing in heaven or on earth can prevent us from drawing near to God. We're also granted the freedom of continual repentance, admitting impurity as we seek purity, all while drawing near to the all-pure one. 
the humble person does not compare himself to others. His point of reference is Christ, the light toward which he is constantly striving as he ventures closer the reality of his sin, the reality of his own lack of humility, his lack of resolve, to, resolve is revealed. He begs for God's mercy. He begs for God's love and healing because he realizes really that nothing can separate him from the love of God aside from his own pride, which is revealed and stripped away and revealed again over and over again so that even for the most mature, illumined and self-realized being, he can say, I've only begun to repent. So begin to repent with me. Let's begin this season. Let's peek through the doors of repentance. We know that all has been accomplished by Christ who loves us for our salvation. Now, all we need to do is strive to let that salvation be accomplished in us. Through the beautiful and great all freeing humility that he's teaching us in today's parable. God grant us a good beginning and true repentance as we prepare to set sail upon the sea of the great fast. Amen.